To begin, I ask you, who should publish? Well, in order to determine who should publish in any specific journal, you should thoroughly explore the journal's webpage to find a description of its audience, aims, scope, and so forth. For example, if you click the About This Journal link on the homepage for the Journal on Empowering Teaching Excellence, whose HTML is listed here, you can find important information about this journal. Furthermore, if you click the Aims and Scope link, then it says the following about who should publish in the Journal on Empowering Teaching Excellence, which I will call JEET from this point forward. This academic peer-reviewed journal targets higher education professionals who engage in the design and practice of instruction. This includes tenure and non-tenure track faculty who teach, instructional designers, librarians, graduate teaching assistants, graduate instructors, and other instructional professionals. This, I think, answers who should publish in this specific journal, as well as probably this question in general. So, what is publishable material? So, this likely varies from one journal to another. Every reputable peer-reviewed journal should have information somewhere on its webpage explaining what type or types of material they publish. JEET's homepage includes the following under its Aims and Scopes section. We invite educators, researchers, and instructional designers to promote, share, and discuss emerging ideas. Articles are focused on higher education, teaching practitioner-based methods in all course delivery formats with focus on the following general categories, which you can read yourself. This is JEET's specific focus. So if you have material that aligns with this focus and your material is of academic quality, then it likely is publishable material in this specific journal. In contrast, different journals would deem different types of material with different focuses as being publishable. So, how do I prepare my draft? Well, there is likely no single correct answer to this question. Whenever I personally prepare a peer-reviewed article or other work for publication, though, I always do the following in this order. First, I read extensive academic material in or adjacent to the area in which I'm writing. This includes reading various publications in my intended target journal by various other authors so I can better see the kind of work that this particular journal publishes. Second, I start writing. Now, during the writing process, I also analyze all of my applicable research data and then use that data to guide my writing. In other words, my article's narrative evolves cyclically as I write, with my data analysis and background reading affecting the article body and vice versa as I move iteratively through multiple drafts. Third, once I finally finish what I deem to be the perfect draft, and I promise as you do this, you'll eventually get to the point where you can just feel it. I then submit it to the journal according to their instructions. For JEET, this is done by clicking the Submit Article link from its homepage. Now, every journal will have a similar link somewhere. And fourth, if desired, before you submit an article, I encourage you to share your draft or drafts with trusted colleagues who are knowledgeable in your field or related fields and will give you honest, critical feedback to help improve your article prior to submitting to thereby maximize its chance of getting published. Now for the question, where do I publish my work? Well, various factors will help determine where to publish your work. I strongly recommend reading the aims and scope section or similar section of every journal's homepage that you are considering. For example, the Journal of Chemical Education's homepage located at this HTML includes a link in the upper right hand corner that you can click to access a sublink entitled Authors and Reviewers. Now, this takes you to a page with instructions on guidelines, the journal's scope, and even downloadable templates that can guide authors in their writing. Factors that you might also consider when picking a journal for publication include, make sure your article matches the journal's scope. As I foreshadowed earlier, do not submit an article about subject A to a journal that does not specialize or publish articles about subject A. In other words, do not mismatch your article. What articles are you citing? Now, as you write your article, you should look at your bibliography or sources cited. Is there a peer-reviewed journal that you cite frequently? If so, then you might consider submitting your article to that journal. And impact factor. Impact factor is a number that conveys how much a journal gets read and cited based on a bunch of algorithms that I don't personally understand. 
Now, not all journals have impact factors. JEET still does not. In general, though, the higher the impact factor number, the more that journal will be read. Impact factors are definitely one thing that you might consider because you probably want your articles to get traction, that is, to be cited and read broadly. JCAM Ed's impact factor, for example, is 1.385. Lastly for me, where should I not publish my work? As it turns out, other than making sure that you do not submit an article on a specific topic to a journal that specializes in a topic that's completely different, that would be an article journal mismatch, you should also be aware of predatory journals. What does this mean? Well, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> Predatory publishing, sometimes called write-only publishing or deceptive publishing, is an exploitative academic publishing business model that involves charging publication fees to authors without checking articles for quality and legitimacy and without providing the other editorial and publishing services that legitimate academic journals provide, whether open access or not. They are regarded as predatory because scholars are tricked into publishing with them, although some authors may be aware that the journal is of poor quality or even fraudulent. Now, one red flag indicator of a predatory journal is a pay-to-play business model. If you encounter a journal that charges you money in order to publish with them, they are probably a predatory, non-legitimate journal. Do not publish with predatory journals. Doing so may cause long-term career headaches and may actually work against you as you are preparing for promotion and tenure. For example, if a promotion and tenure committee sees that you've published numerous peer-reviewed articles, that actually looks good. But if they then realize that these articles were published in a predatory journal in which you are able to pay money in exchange for having them published, that will actually work against you and may cost you promotion or tenure. The website, whose HTML is shown right here, provides a really good list of possible predatory journals. Also, whenever I personally get an email from a journal that I've never heard of previously and suspect that it may be predatory, and this happens to me sometimes a couple times a week, I frequently forward that email to my USU subject librarian. And you can find a list of our subject librarians at this HTML. And I then ask my subject librarian, can you please find out if this is a predatory journal? Now, if it is, then I know to definitely not submit articles to that journal. So along with being aware of predatory journals and some of the other things that Mike talked about, Mike was just referencing subject librarians. And as we go, kind of want to take a deeper dive into how to choose a journal. A couple things that you want to do is go to several journals. You might think you know where you want to publish, but don't be afraid to look at several journals. Make a list of the aims and scopes of those journals. Make sure that they match that of your area of study. Ensure that your indexing preference matches the indexing of the journal. Now, I'm going to be honest and tell you I don't know a ton about indexing. I do know that it's highly relevant in more in the science and STEM journals than it is in some of the humanities journals. But even in the humanities journals, English indexing, language indexing, those kinds of things, they are very relevant. And if you're unsure about your indexing, go and visit with your subject librarian. And I've included the link here so that when you're looking at this presentation, you can just click on that. Also, Check for the types of articles that are published by the journals that you're looking at. So for instance, if you're using a lot of data and the articles that you're looking at feel more anecdotal, going back to what Mike was saying a few minutes ago, make sure you're reading the articles in the journals you're looking at and find where yours is the best match, not just for indexing, but also for the rhetorical context of what you're writing. Make sure you're looking at other aspects of the journal, for instance, the NCTE you have to be a member in order to submit, and there is a yearly membership fee for that. Some journals are print only still, believe it or not. Some are only online. Make sure you're looking at the other aspects of the journal. And finally, make a list of the journals that meet all of your criteria, prepare your manuscript according to the author guidelines, and submit. So one thing that's interesting, in addition to hunting through and pecking through a bunch of journals, maybe ones that you're familiar with, if you're wanting to know what else is out there, the Elsevier uh, website, the link that I've included here, does have a really interesting page that if you upload your abstract and your paper information, they will help you find journal matches. 
This is where that indexing becomes important, right? So this is something that's very interesting and maybe a, a help to some of you that are really new to academic publishing and maybe are only familiar with a very limited number of journals. So what are the journal requirements? There are a lot of fine print and my biggest advice to anyone who's interested in academic publication is do not be intimidated by the amount of time that it might take you to navigate the journals that you're interested in. This is an investment in the front end to make sure your article is a good fit, that it's as ready as possible, uh, that will save you a lot of time on the back end once you've submit. You don't want to have to get rejection letters or major uh, revision required letters multiple times. There's no shame in having major revisions required. It's common. There's no shame in being rejected and asking questions about if you redo the article, can you resubmit? Most of the reviewers will say, this is rejected carte blanche because it doesn't fit with this journal, or they will say, it's rejected unless they do these things, and they will tell you why it was rejected. You get to decide if you want to go through the revisions process. But by taking the time before you submit, you can avoid having some of that painful process on the back end. If you are in a rush to publish, it is important that you check the issue dates of the journal that you're looking at and read through the fine print again regarding the review process and how long that might take. So additionally, Elsevier does accept academic publication. And again, we want to make sure that we're taking lots of time to read the fine print. So here is an example of a publishing with Elsevier step-by-step. -step. And they have step-by-step -step information that will walk you through what the requirements are for publishing in their journal. Every journal has them. Some are more difficult to find than others. NCTE, you do have to pay to be a member to publish in NCTE. So it is a little difficult. It's more difficult to find their publication requirements. You actually have to log in and do a search. Unless there's anyone here that has more information about NCTE, we'd love for you to submit comments to our presentation. I know many people have published in NCTE, but you can see by looking through their website, the fine print is a little bit trickier. Don't be intimidated by that. You can always contact them and they will give you the information for publication. Finally, the Journal on Empowering Teaching Excellence, which is who we represent, your account information is housed clear down here. You will need to create an account. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. Mike talked about aims and scope of this journal. If you go to there, here's the aims and scope. And then about this journal, so this journal is actually a little bit trickier to navigate for publication than maybe Elsevier was. It's less obvious, but you need to spend the time just figuring it out because some are really obvious and some you do have to dig a little deeper. Additionally, um, after you've figured out your word count, your formatting, find if they have a rubric, other submission instructions. Uh, use an objective source to apply the journal rubric to your work and ask them to be brutal. So one more thing I would like to present to you is Grammarly.com. I have my students actually download it onto their phones. <laughs> but Grammarly.com is a great way to catch those last few little errors that you might have. One of the features that I especially love about Grammarly is that if I pull up a document, I can adjust the goals for the document. So I can change it to expert, formal, academic. I use this in my classroom as with my students as well as um, when I'm editing for the journal. So when I do your final copy at I edit, I shamelessly use Grammarly to make sure that I've caught everything. And you see here, let's, so let me change it to expert and formal and academic. And you can see here that then it will run it through and it will tell you where this document lies and it will give you color-coded suggestions as well as things that are actual mistakes that need to go back and be fixed. So do yourself a favor and run your own work through Grammarly. Thomas Kilgallen has a book about grammar and grammar mistakes and he talks about it's important to know the rules of grammar and then if you're choosing to break a rule of mechanics or grammar, you know that you're doing that intentionally for effect 
and that's acceptable. In academic work, obviously, it's less acceptable than in creative work. But if you're choosing to use a comma instead of a semicolon, at least you're aware that Grammarly is going to pick it up and you can address that in a conversation with your editors and your reviewers should they be really tripped up on something like that. One thing that we talked about when we were preparing this presentation is all the advice that we're giving is also super relevant if you are doing grant writing. So making sure that you are shopping your grant to the proper location, making being aware of predatory grant sites, and being sure that you are following all of the step-by-step -step instructions. So we just wanted to kind of throw that in there because it sort of came up in our conversations when we were making this presentation. I would like to just make a quick plug also for internal review board. If you don't know what that is, you should make sure that you find the IRB, internal review board IRB page at your university or institution and go over that to find out if your work is something that needs to be reviewed by the IRB. Most publications will require you to at least check a box that says you have an IRB or that you have a letter of determination. So make sure you know what that is, make sure you've gone to that site before you submit. Um, and I would just say if you're looking at academic publication, just take a trip over to the IRB site and review that to make sure that it doesn't apply to you and if it does to follow their process before you start submitting your work. It also it may feel intuitive but do not si submit your article or even a close kissing cousin of a similar article to another journal simultaneously while you're submitting to journal A. So if you've submitted to journal A don't submit to anywhere else until you either have formally withdrawn your article or you have been rejected. Those would be the only two circumstances that would allow you then to shop that to another journal. One journal at a time is the rule of thumb. Okay, so what happens after you hit submit? So when you visit the JEET page for the very first time, you will need to, first of all, my advice is to click follow. This is like clicking subscribe. You can also click here to receive email notices or RSS. It will ask you to sign in with your digital commons username and password. What happens if you don't have a digital commons username or password? Then go down here to my account. It's buried in a very non-intuitive place and you will need to create an account right here. So don't have an account? Sign up with digital commons. Now once you've created your account then you can go back to the journal homepage and you can click follow so that you and you will receive email updates when we publish, when we make changes, calls for articles twice a year will come if you have signed yourself up to follow. Um, once you click submit, then you will your article will be assigned a tracking number. When you log in, you can look at your article to see what step in the process it is in and then I will also use that number to send you notifications when your reviewers send feedback or if they have questions. Once you've hit submit, you will be assigned two reviewers. The Journal of Empowering Teaching Excellence does engage in a double blind review process. Your reviewers will not know your name and you will not know their names. Once I receive their recommendations, which are accept, minor changes requested, major changes required, or reject, then I send that to you. Now, there is a little bit of a caveat that is specific to our journal. Everybody has glitches, right? Because everyone uses different software. So for our particular journal, one of our glitches is if I select minor changes when I send your work back to you with the reviewers' comments and suggestions, it unmasks the double blind part of our process. And at that point, then you know who your reviewers are and they know who you are. In order to preserve academic rigor, what I've chosen to do is if you need to make minor changes to your work, your letter of determination will say major changes required, but I will insert a line in there to assure you that you just need to make minor changes. So make sure you're reading, again, fine print. It might just look like a form letter, but I always write a personal note in those letters. So make sure that you're reading those. I believe that most editors do the same. Once you receive that original feedback from your reviewers, then you get to decide. Do you want to make the changes that they've requested? If the answer to that is yes, then you do that and you resubmit. 
I give the reviewers four weeks to look at your work. I request that within four weeks you get it back to me. We have a six month turnaround time for the journal, so it does happen pretty quickly from that point on. Once you've resubmitted, the process will repeat until your work has been accepted. I'll then do a final copy edit, and this is another little glitch with Digital Commons. Once I do your final copy edit, I will send it to you one last time for your final publication approval. Some people are really confused. They're like, I thought I was already approved. Why are you asking me to do that again? That's because I've performed a final copy edit and I will write that in your email. It'll say, this is your final copy edit. Please make sure it's ready for publication. And then I will approve it and it will go in the hopper. And then when we publish, you will be notified. So we do have some frequently asked questions that I would like to talk about. I did mention one of the most frequently asked questions I get is, can I track my document? The answer to that is yes. Just make sure you've created an account. One other frequently asked question, people are a little bit intimidated by this process, and I say, send me an email. My email is included on the main page of the journal. It's also included on the last page of this presentation. Send me an email and ask to be added to the reviewer list. If you review other people's work, it's similar to what Mike referred to at the beginning of this presentation when you go to an, a journal and read a lot of articles. Being a reviewer helps you investigate the back end of the publication process and it takes a lot of the stigma out and it really has helped a lot of authors present better work because of their reviewing experiences. So I really highly encourage you to sign up to be a reviewer. And finally, how will I know when my article is being published? Again, I will email you and let you know, but also in other journals, you can track your article, but you can also look at the publication dates of those particular journals. And that's how you'll know when your work is coming out. The next question is, how will I know if my articles are being read? From the JEET homepage that you can see here, you can click on any article listed in any issue. For example, you can click this drop down menu and click a previous issue in which your specific article or any other articles that interest you are found. As you go down and click any of those articles, for instance this one, you can now see the total number of downloads for that specific article. In contrast, you can also scroll down to the bottom of the JEET homepage and see a map that will gradually populate as you leave it open on your web browser to show in live real time how many articles are being downloaded and where they are being downloaded. And lastly, how can I share my article? As it turns out, each journal usually has a different policy with regard to where and with whom and how many times you're allowed to share an article because most journals retain copyright ownership over the articles once they're published. So there are some limitations. You should consult the journal's specific instructions for authors with regard to what their policy is. For JEET articles, while you can share by email the individual articles, we strongly encourage you to share the specific HTML for the journal homepage so we can increase traction and downloads of the journal and individual articles. Because it is an open source journal, anyone anywhere across the world should be able to access it for free. So like I say, some journals do have limitations with when, where, how, and how many times you're allowed to share an article. JEET, however, does not. That's one reason among many why we invite you strongly to publish with us. We end then with our contact info. If you have any feedback about this talk, questions, comments, we would love to hear from you. Please feel free to contact either of us at the emails shown here.